Happy New Year, Golden Hour family. As we step into 2024, we are revisiting one of our most downloaded episodes of 2023. I'm Liz, your host, and today we're diving into the first episode of Nicolette's birth story. Nicolette, a labor and delivery nurse from Virginia, shares her story, one that began with the decision to become a nurse after her first child and led to a chilling premonition during her second pregnancy. Fast forward to a life-threatening moment during childbirth where she fought not just for herself but for her son. In today's rebroadcast, we'll unravel the incredible tale of Nicolette's survival against the odds, a splenic artery aneurysm, a rare and perilous condition, changed the course of her life. Stay tuned to hear Nicolette's gripping narrative, a story of courage, resilience, and the unwavering determination to defy fate. This is part one of Nicolette's story. You can listen to part two and three in earlier episodes. We'll be back next week with a new birth story. The Golden Hour Birth Podcast, a podcast about real birth stories and creating connections through our shared experiences. Childbirth isn't just about the child. It's about the person who gave birth, their lives, their wisdom, and their empowerment. We're Liz and Natalie, the Golden Hour Birth Podcast, and we're here to laugh with you cry with you and hold space for you. Welcome to the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. I am your co-host Liz and I'm your co-host Natalie and tonight we have Nicolette from Virginia on. Um, She is a labor and delivery nurse and going to be sharing her own experience. I do just want to put a trigger, excuse me, a trigger warning out to our listeners um, that this mama, Nicolette, had an almost um, near-death experience, and her son, um, Alec, was in the NICU as well, being a full-term baby. So just want to check in with yourselves and see how you're feeling about listening to this. Um, but Nicolette, thanks so much for coming on tonight. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so excited. Yeah. Um, so if you want to go ahead, well, first, I think we should just say it's been one year to the day. Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, but practically, I was I was at the hospital right now. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So one year later, and we're kind of just going to be, I don't know, shutting this experience with you. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and tell us a little bit about you and your family. Okay. Um, so my name is Nicolette. As you said, I'm a labor delivery nurse here at a well-known level one trauma center. Um, love my job to death. Um, I have a daughter that's 10 years old and my son Alec is going to be a year old tomorrow. I always say me and my husband, but he's really my fiance. (laughs) We've been, we've had a really long engagement because a lot of things have happened in our life over time. Um, Mm -hmm. But we have been dating since I'm 19 years old and he was 22. So this year we will be celebrating 18 years together, 19 years together. Wow. 19 years together. Um, Yeah. I met him when I was living in New York. And then I moved to Virginia. And I was like, we got to break up because I can't do long distance. This is crazy. We haven't been together long enough to even like make this work. And he was like, we're not breaking up. And I was like, okay, Serge, whatever you say. (laughs) And I moved to Virginia and we did long distance for about three and a half years. A lot of ups and downs from it, but eventually he moved out here and we got accidentally pregnant. I was on the pill and I was like, where's my period? (laughs) I got pregnant, but that pregnancy resulted in a miscarriage. And then six months almost to the date, I was pregnant with my daughter accidentally. (laughs) After my mom had had a heart attack on Serge's 30th birthday. So wow. we we really know how to do tragedy in my family. <laughs> and it was just like stress sex. And then like, boom, I was pregnant. And I was like, how did that happen so fast and so easy? Um, my pregnancy with me was super easy. I wasn't sick. I loved being pregnant. Um, my body really likes being pregnant too. And her, I went to 41 weeks, was induced. 
everything was fine. It was pretty quick labor for our first time mom. Um, I remember getting my epidural at like nine ish in the morning. And then I was complete by noon. I labored down a little bit. I pushed for an hour and a half and she was born. So like totally just non-eventful, you know, just your basic delivery, breastfed, loved being a mom. I mean, just all the things. I was like, oh my gosh, I just had a kid. Like I'm superhero. Look at me. I'm woman. Hear me roar. Burn the bra. Like all the things. <laughs> Um, loved the postpartum stage. It was it was so amazing with her. She really easy baby, and everything was cool. And then I was like, I gotta, I need like a change in my life. And I went back to school to become a labor and delivery nurse. I had like a calling to it, which is anyone that knows me knows that like I never like needles, blood, like ill, ill, ill. But I was nursing her one night. And I looked down at her just thinking of how far we came because the first week, two weeks of breastfeeding was like really, really difficult. But then here we were like six months later, just nursing beautifully. And she's like looking up at me. And I had this calling like, you should be you should be a nurse. You should be a labor and delivery nurse. And I was like, I don't I don't really know that I would be good at that. Like, well, who said that? <laughs> Why am I getting this calling? This is strange. So the first thing I did was call my best friend, Stephanie. And I she answered and I was like, what would you say if I told you that I wanted to go back to school to be a nurse? And she like, I would say it's about fucking time. <laughs> and I was like, what? She's like, I've been waiting for you to to come to this conclusion. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me sooner? I'm 27 <laughs> years old. You know how old I'm going to be when I finish school? <laughs> um. But I did it. I went to school. It was hard. Serge was like like a single dad for about four years because it's just study, 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 study. And I was like, I'm going to work at that hospital on that labor unit. It's where I had Mina. It's where my sister had her kids. Like, I'm doing it. And I did it. Um, And we talked and floated the idea around about having a second baby. But, you know, I was in school and then it was like, oh, I'm like in my 30s now. I don't know if I want to do it. Mina's so independent, like starting over, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then in 2021, I forget around what time I just was like, I feel like I got floated up to the HRP unit, which is high risk pregnancy. And basically up there, it's like you have your preterm labor that preterm labor is that we've stopped labor but we're just monitoring or uh, premature rupture of membranes that we're monitoring um hyperemesis getting fluid stuff like that any any contractions or anything starts to go down they come down to the labor and delivery unit so i was floated up there and i just had a night where i was just like in thought and i said oh my gosh if i was on my deathbed like the one thing i would regret in my whole entire life is not having another baby so I was like, I'm going to go home and I'm going to talk to Serge about having another baby. I mean, I deliver babies for a living. It's like my ovaries are always like, oh, my God, girl, do it again. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I went home. I went night shift. So I had to like he went to work and I was sleeping all day and then he came home and, and I had a conversation with him and I, I wasn't really sure how it was going to go, like what he was going to say. And I was like, you know. And I did the whole spiel about being on my deathbed. And I was like, so I was thinking, like, maybe, maybe we should just try to have another baby. And he was like, okay. And I was like, but wait a minute. Did you just say okay? And he's like, yeah, let's do it. And I was like, oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Like, Why are you crying? I was like, I totally thought you were going to fight me about it because, like, we always go back and forth. And he's like, no, like, I, I want another baby. I think he wanted another baby for years. Just didn't put his foot down about it because I was also kind of like, oh, I don't know. You know, like we get to travel with Mina's grown and we travel and it's easy. And then it's like newborns, diapers, strollers, like feeding, exhaustion. I don't know that I want to do that again, but I love being a mom and I love being pregnant. So I just needed kind of like the universe, like kick me in my ass and remind me about that. Plus, my daughter has been asking to be a big sister since she's like four years old. Mm -hmm. So, like, imagine the sure, like, piece of shit that I felt like when I told my daughter, I was like, I don't know, Mina. 
I don't know that that's, you know, ever going to happen. Like, I think that you're going to be, be it, you know, like we, we love you and we don't need another baby. And she was like, oh, <laughs> crying. And I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. I've never met a four or five year old that wanted to be a sibling so bad. Like, whoa. And it's just kind of always like, wait on me. Like if we die, she has nobody. Mm-hmm. And, and she just wanted it so bad. So I'm going to take a sip of my tea. After I had the conversation with Serge, I was like, all right, well, I've been on the pill since Mina was born. And now I was 36 at the time. I'm 36. Like, it's probably not going to be easy. I have endometriosis now. Like, there's a, or, or I always had it, but then found out I had it when Mina was two. And I was like, it may take a while. So I'm going to stop taking the pill in like May. And then we can start trying in November 2021. And then hopefully I'll get pregnant by November and maybe have the baby July 2022, whatever. And then my period just like randomly came in the middle of my pill pack. So then I just stopped taking it because I was like, well, what's the point? I have my period. So I'm just going to stop. So I wound up stopping taking it earlier. And then I had like a bunch of periods in a month. I had a period like five days. And then three days later, I had another period. And I'm like, I'm never going to get pregnant if this doesn't like, like even out. So in the meantime, I was like, hmm, I took my OB, but she delivers at this hospital. So I work at for Inova and Inova has like five hospitals. Inova system has five hospitals in Northern Virginia. And I work at Fairfax, which is the level one trauma center and is like the main medical campus. And then there's Fair Oaks, which is like 10 minutes from my house. Down the road, one of my sisters had her son there. Really nice hospital, really cute. But I had this like thought, like, you know, if something was were to happen, we would be transferred to Fairfax anyway. So we might as well just deliver at Fairfax. Like we delivered Mina. I'll switch my OB. You know, I work with these people, so I know their style and how, you know, how they, how they, how they are. And I wound up switching um, to Dr. Dr. Lumpel with this group IMGs. Amazing. And I, I chose a guy. I went from a woman to a guy because I felt like I've watched him. I've delivered with him. I watch him interact with the dads. And I really liked how involved he got the dads. And I felt like this was going to be really, a really, really <laughs> different experience because now that I'm in the field, like I had access to ultrasound so I could like get a sneak peek all the time at my son. And it was just such an incredible thing that Serge never saw. The only ultrasound he saw of Mina was her anatomy scan. Mm -hmm. But like with Alec, he got to see him like floating around and like (laughs) at all these different stages until he it was just like a head. (laughs) So, um, and, you know, my coworkers, I mean, it was like, it was the unit baby. Like, it wasn't just my baby. Everyone was so happy that I was pregnant and and all this stuff. But I, anyway, I wound up getting pregnant very quickly. Like, I had to think about when I had sex to get pregnant. Because I was like, how, how am I pregnant? I didn't even remember having sex. Like, what is going on? So <laughs> we had a trip to Puerto Rico in July of 2021. And I had a surge as a last minute packer. So literally, he like came home from work and started packing and we had to leave. And I'm like, oh, my God, like, what are you doing? So he's like, I'm a little hungry. Let me throw these frozen meatballs in the oven. And he put them in and I was like, what the fuck is that smell? What is that smell? And he's like, it's the meatballs. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's disgusting. I'm going to (laughs) throw up. And he's like, what the hell? Are you pregnant? I'm like, you have to have sex to get pregnant. Like, I'm not pregnant, you know, like. (laughs) And then um, it was really odd because I. I felt like I took a a nap and I could hear him like packing his stuff. And you know, when you're kind of like awake, but asleep. So whatever's going on in the background kind of makes its way into your dream. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a dream that I was napping. He was packing and I was like, you know what? I'm going to take this pregnancy test. Where did I get a pregnancy? I'm like, I don't have any pregnancy test, but in my dream, I was like, I'm going to get, I'm going to take this pregnancy test and that I took it and I was pregnant. So I like 
shut up. <laughs> I was like, do you still have to go to the store? He's like, yeah, I got to run to Target because, you know, Target run before our flight also, whatever. Mm-hmm. So we run to Target. I pick up a pregnancy test and I, t- I we get home and I take it immediately. And I like look at it and I didn't see anything. So I tossed it. We went to Puerto Rico. I was drinking. Your girl was having a good time. Your girl fell down the stairs, dropped like a whole <laughs> flight of stairs, drunk, like bum, 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 bum. <laughs> um, no care in the world. You know, like I was really tired when I was there, but like we were waking up at the crack of dawn and just all, we were all over Puerto Rico. And then we got home. It was the next night. I remember I had like a rage because sir, like the next day, Serge is like, I'm going to go hiking with your brother. And I'm like, we just got home from Puerto Rico. We need to unpack and like get ourselves ready to go back to work. You're going hiking. And he's like, yeah, I'm like, you're on no sleep. He's like, I'm going to be fine. I'm like, oh, my God. I was like enraged. I was like, oh, this, this man, I'm going to have to unpack everything by myself. Um. He gets home. I said, because you're going to come home and you're going to be too tired to unpack and it's going to drive me nuts that your suitcase is going to sit there like all week. He's like, no, 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 I'm going to do it. Sure enough, he comes home and he falls asleep and I'm just like seething. I'm looking at him as seething. And I started to get like lower back pain. And I was like, like kind of cramping. And I was like, oh, I wonder where my periods do. I probably am due for my period. And I open my my app and I look at it and then like three days are grayed out. And it's like, did you forget the longer period? And I was like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's right. I was supposed to get my period when I was in Puerto Rico and I completely forgot about that. Didn't pack anything, like just completely oblivious to the, to the whole thing. Even though I was like, list, tampons, pants, like you're getting your period, you know, <laughs> I'm just completely. Or... So I'm like, okay. I look at Mina. She's awake. I'm like, Mama has to go to the store because I don't feel good. Like my stomach hurts, even though like total lie. I just didn't want her to know yet because I know what can go wrong. I didn't want her to get her excited if, you know, it wasn't going to go all the way to term or whatever. So she's like, okay, mama. I'm like, I'm just going to go get some medicine for my tummy. She's like, okay. I drive to CVS. I pick up like four boxes <laughs> of pregnancy tests. I pee on all of them. And it's like, it took the longest time to result. And I'm like, oh, my God, why am I so nervous? Like this, I'm either pregnant or I'm not pregnant. Like, why am I nervous? It's not like I was like, you know, I wasn't trying. And uh, boom, it said pregnant. And I just was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. (laughs) So I like, I wake up Serge and I'm like, Serge, Serge. And he's like, I'm like. (laughs) And he's like. Oh, okay. I fell back to sleep and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so I send me to the sleep. I go to sleep. I mean, I, I texted his sister. I texted my best friend and they were like, oh my God. And it's like, it was really early. Like, so I had no right to texting anybody, but I was like so excited. Um, In the morning, he was getting ready for bed and I, I, I don't know why I was up because Mina didn't have school, but I was up for something. And he comes into the bathroom and he's like, was I dreaming or are you pregnant? And I was like, I'm pregnant. And he was like, oh, oh my God. And I was like, I know. He was like, when? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but I think, I think I was pregnant. Bef- like, obviously, I was in the process of being pregnant on my way to Puerto Rico. And I think my test was positive. I just didn't wait long enough because it was the lines. Because the first one that I took was a line and it was barely there. And I almost threw it out. And then I was like, wait a minute, what is that? And it was a line. So I'm like, thank God. I wouldn't have done half the things that I did in Puerto Rico. And I know, and you know, I just would have been like, nope, I'm not jumping off of that into the water. Are you crazy? I'm pregnant. Like, I'm not doing that. Yeah. Um, so I was like, this poor kid, I fell down a flight of stairs. <laughs> this poor little fetus is like bump, 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 bump all over my uterus. <laughs> so, um, we're like, okay, we're not telling Mina right now. We're going to wait. I bought like the cute shirts from Etsy, like big sister finally and only child crossed out big sister, you know, like all those things. And we waited till I hit 13 weeks. 
And we told her. And she just was like over the moon excited. I, again, have never seen a child be so happy to be getting a sibling. I cannot believe you waited that long. Like, <laughs> it was I mean, hard like, rock, to keep it a secret from your child that long. That's well, it was I wasn't months. I wasn't sick. You know, I, yeah. I had really a really easy pregnancy with Alec, too. Like I wasn't sick and she didn't know. She just one day was like I had some white claws in the fridge that were going <laughs> ignored. And she's like, Mama, you're not drinking these anymore. It's been a long time. And I was like, <laughs> you are correct. Um, it, it has been. Um, and she's like, why? And I'm like, why is my daughter so observant? <laughs> like, what, what is her problem? <laughs> um, and I just said, you know, I just haven't been like in the mood. I've been working. I can't, you know, drink those if I have to go to work. So, and she's like, <laughs> and she just closed the door and I was like, whoa, <laughs> crisis averted, right? <laughs> um, so after I told her, that was maybe August or September. I was at work one night and I we just had so many demises at one time. And it was heartbreaking to sit there. I mean, being pregnant, they never assigned me the demises, but you, you know, hearing uh these women just crying, so broken, the pain in their their screams and their cries. It, it was like, it was a lot. And I'm like, you know, I knew things could go wrong in pregnancies before I was a labor and delivery nurse, but then you, then you know all the things that can go wrong. And you're just like, this is so horrible to work here while you're pregnant because like there are some really good days, but there are some really shitty days. Mm -hmm. And you just go home and you take that with you and you're thinking of these families and these babies and you just can't shake it um it was around that time i had bled at work not like active red bleeding but like more of like old kind of chocolatey blood almost but it was a lot it was a lot enough where i absolutely panicked broke into tears immediately because i was like i just told mina that we were having a baby like this isn't going to be just my loss it's going to be her loss too and i don't know if i can handle that yeah um so my my hospital has an obed that's separate from the emergency department so there's the er and then there's obed so ER, the er will literally send a pregnant woman if she has a the flu they're going to send her to us even though they can absolutely treat her <laughs> but because she's pregnant they're going to send her to us so I just went, I was working and I didn't have a patient. I just discharged my patient, went to the bathroom, saw this, freaked out, went down to OBED and got checked out. And they're just like, maybe it was a sub, uh, uh, subdural hematoma, not subdural, uh, now I'm having a brain fart. <laughs> um, it's just like a, ha like a previous hemorrhage, like in your uterine lining that like your body just wound up like dumping out mm -hmm. at this time my water mm -hmm. wasn't broken i wasn't actively bleeding ultrasound was good alec looked good but they're like take it easy subchorionic hemorrhage that's the word thank you brain <laughs> <laughs> um take it easy so i was like home for five days but i was really really nervous um because i was like this could be a precursor like this i could be losing this pregnancy and this is just like the beginning but over the days it resolved and everything was better and I didn't really think much of it after that because there was no need. Somewhere in my second pregnancy, second trimester, I started to develop this feeling that I could not shake. And I always said, like, I, I said, I'm afraid I'm going to die in labor. But it wasn't like, oh, I'm afraid, like, I'm afraid my plane is going to crash because I'm afraid of flying. It was like a knowing. It felt like I knew that this was going to happen. And I was walking the plank almost like every day after that. And I remember me and my OB would sometimes get half of my appointments done at work because we would just talk. He's like, are you like, are you doing this? Are you doing that? And I'm like, yeah. So he's like, how are you feeling? I was like, I mean, I feel good. I, you know, I'm tired, but I feel good. But 
I just, I can't shake this feeling that I maybe am going to die in labor. And he looks at me and we're both New Yorkers. And he's like, why would you say that? I'm like, well, you asked me how I was feeling and that's what I'm feeling. So I feel like you should know that I have this feeling that something is going to happen to me in labor. And he's like, I mean, what are you supposed to do with that? Like, I, I wasn't like, oh, yeah, this is going to happen exactly. It was just this like. Like, I, I could say fear, but it wasn't a fear. It was just this like I just had this premonition. Mm-hmm. And. I think about my pregnancy with Mina and I'm like, I was very anxious during my pregnancy with Mina because I had lost my pregnancy before. So I was terrified that I was going to lose her. But I didn't have this feeling that I'm having now. This is completely different. I told I told anybody that would listen. My coworkers knew, my sister, my mom, Serge, not my daughter, but you know, my friends, like they knew. I was like, I I have this feeling. I just, I don't know. Some I feel like something's gonna happen. Did you have like anxiety about that? Like, like, you know. The feelings of anxiety around that, too? It wasn't really, like, anxiety. I didn't feel calm about it, but I didn't feel super anxious about it because I I didn't have any reason to believe that something was going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any reason to believe I was going to have a near miss. Like, I was healthy. The only thing was I was advanced maternal age at 36. Like, I'm Mm -hmm. old. Like, (laughs) But otherwise, like I, I was with MFM for follow up because I was because I was 36. I had to get more ultrasounds with them to make sure that my placenta was OK and that Alec was growing. So I had a couple of extra ultrasounds, but everything was fine. Like they were like, you're completely healthy, healthy pregnancy, healthy mom, blah, 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 whatever. And so I just was like, you know, I had that feeling, but it, it was just kind of like, well, what? Other than like an AFE, like what? could possibly happen. So I got in my mind, like, maybe, maybe I think I'm going to have an AFE when I deliver. Like, I don't know, you know. Um, AFE is an amniotic fluid embolism. So it's basically, typically happens like right at delivery or right after delivery, maternal blood and amniotic fluid mixes. And some people's Mm -hmm. bodies have like an extreme allergic reaction to that. And it just causes a cascade of horrible things happening. Multi-organ failure, stroke, DIC, like bleeding and clotting at the same time. Yeah. Um, it's a horrible, horrible thing. Um, yeah, actually, on Instagram, I, when I started having this feeling, I started following Kaylee, the birth trauma mama. Uh-huh. And then I came across another um, AFE survivor who... Um, Kathy Garrett and she has um, the birth trauma stories podcast Mm -hmm. and we like Kaylee's platform has grown exponentially so you can't really form like a close close relationship with her but she's very good about like answering messages and stuff like that and she's like a therapist too so she's got a lot going on and Kathy has her you know she's still still dealing with the side effects from her AFE so she's home and she does her podcast so we've developed a closer relationship um after everything happened to me but i started following these things like along with, with my pregnancy just like educating myself because i haven't come across an afe at work and the one afe that did happen i wasn't there when it happened so mm-hmm. i didn't get to see it i didn't see how anyone on the unit handled it i was just wasn't working that day um And then I also followed Tila, the T on birth trauma, but she didn't have an AFE. And I just, I don't know, I just started following something, just told me to just start following these pages. And I did. And um, just educating myself on like AFE. And I was telling Serge, like, it happened so fast. So if I'm like, oh my God, you know, like there, that's it. Like things are going to start rolling and everything's going to be horrible. And he was just like, where are you showing me this? And I'm like, because you need to know, like, you need to know that, that this could happen. Like, this is one of the things that could happen to me. And he just was like, okay. Like, you know, again, what are you supposed to do about that? But I had almost like this frantic, like, I need to gather information on these things because something's going to happen, whether it's an AFE or something else. I don't know. 
Um, and what happened to me, I didn't even know could happen. So, um, you know, time went on. Everything was fine. I was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then January 2022 rolled around. And that's when everything just really went to like hell in a handbasket. Like, I took Serge away for his 40th birthday, like three hours to the mountains. We had a beautiful weekend together. Came back that night. We missed the snowstorm there, but got it in Northern Virginia. He took Nina sledding and he wound up tearing his spinal cord. So he was leaking. He has spinal tear that was leaking spinal cord fluid for five days before he would let me take him to the oh hospital because he's a man and men do not listen to their wives that are nurses when they're telling them that something is wrong. Um, and I, I think it looks like seven months pregnant in the ER with him after just working a three in a row. And he, it was, his job was like COVID because he had this crazy headache. And they're like, COVID, COVID. And they saw him I'm like, you don't sound like you have COVID. You sound like you have a spinal headache. Did you hit your head when you were like, letting I didn't hit my head I'm like are you sure did you hit your back like you know it's all connected so like you must have hit something you know if this is traveling he's like I just hit my ass I told you I hit my ass but he said he hit his ass so hard he saw like colors and the pain was like so bad and all this stuff so once all the tests came back negative I was like that's it we're going like I don't I don't care we're going and I took him to Fair Oaks because it was closer. Fairfax's ED is just like so busy. So we got seen right away at Fair Oaks. Um, and it was just really funny because they were like in the chart. I was like reading his chart and they were like, wife at bedside, labor and delivery nurse, wife at bedside, Innova nurse, wife is a nurse, 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 nurse. Because they, they, you know, sometimes I experience very often when I go to like urgent cares or whatever, doctors are just kind of dismissive. They don't know you. They don't know your history. So they were kind of trying to say that he was having, he has a history of migraine. So they're saying it's a migraine. And I was like, I can understand why you would think that, but this is not a migraine. He hasn't had a migraine for five days ever. Mm -hmm. I'm like his migraines, he can't, he could stand up with his mic. He's not standing up for more than two minutes before he's in excruciating pain. He doesn't have a migraine. Wife at bedside, nurse. <laughs> but funny <laughs> enough, just like kind of like in between, read in between the lines, she's being difficult. But I wasn't being difficult. I knew he didn't have a migraine. And they took him for a CT scan and we found out that he had the, the spinal tear. And I just looked at him and I was like, so why do you think I got an education in nursing? Like, <laughs> why don't you listen to me when I say things? <laughs> like, I know I deliver babies, but I know other things too. But like, <laughs> <laughs> so it's that's how it started off and it was super stressful and then we had just it was just a series of unfortunate events moving last minute having to live in a hotel for two weeks because of a housing like lapse and it just was a lot and I remember feeling at the time like I can almost laugh at it now because I felt like at that time it was like the worst thing that I was going through it's like I'm pregnant I'm like due in three weeks we are not, we don't even have a place to live. Like we were in the middle of signing. So I just, and he was so stressed out. Poor guy. He was so stressed out. I would like sob in the car and just like drive me to school. And I wound up going on maternity leave two weeks early because I was like, we got into the condo and we just had to start getting ready. Mm hmm and it was like a mad rush. And I mean, there's so much work that needed to be done. And I could only do but so much because I was large and in charge. <laughs> and I could not, you know, hang. I'm like, I need to take a break. My back hurts. Mm -hmm. And my Braxton Hicks started at like 16 weeks. So like if I was overdoing it, like I would start cramping like a lot. Um, so we were getting ready. Talked with my OB. The plan was, I said, I don't want to wait to 41 weeks. For Mina, I would love to go into labor on my own, um, but I kind of like the idea of the controlled induction and having a little bit of say over like what is happening. And I'm just so happy that I I did this. Um, so he was like, "Okay, we'll do set 39." So my due date was 325, but I was like, "Let's start my induction the night of 323 because then I'll have Alec on 324." which is my dad's birthday. 
So my dad and Alec will have the same birthday, and that's so cool. And my dad was like digging it. <laughs> um, and my Dr. Limpel was going to let Serge help deliver Alec. So once he started crowning, coming out, Serge was, you know, going to be waiting there with the several gloves and a gown, and he was going to help him guide Alec out and put him onto my chest. And I was like, oh, my God, it's going to be the Lion King. We're going to be like, oh. Oh, you know, like, and just we had this whole beautiful plan. And my sister was my doula, so she was present because we had we had opened back up to like have three people in the rooms because it was like it's 2022, you know, people were get we were getting more lax with COVID, but then like the numbers went back up, so they put it back down to one support person and a doula. So I was like. My sister's my doula. <laughs> wink, wink. And, you know, nobody was going to say anything. They were like, yeah, yeah, your sister's your doula. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we just had, I remember wanting Mina to be there. And then I was like, you know, it's probably better if she's not because God forbid something happens, like a, like a stat C-section or something. I don't want her to see that. Like, it could be really... You know, even if it's just, no, we're we're just going back because the baby's, you know, not looking that great. We're just going to go back. It can it can be very rushed, looked at from the outside and be really scary. So I was like, I don't I don't want her um, to be there if something like that happens. Mm-hmm. And. Whatever, 323 came at this time last year, I was on my unit starting my induction. My coworkers decorated my room. Oh. Um, I don't know if you guys had seen any of the reels that I did on Instagram, but they decorated my room so beautifully yeah. for Alec. Yeah. And that room was just like, I had great deliveries in that room. I was, I loved it. And it was a straight shot to the OR. Straight shot, like a 30 second run to the OR, if if not less. And I just was like, this is a great spot. And the night was like super uneventful. <laughs> I was walking around the unit with my coworkers. It's like I couldn't get out of work mode too. You know, I was like, I'm not with that tracing. Oh my God, do you want me to go in and flip her? You know, like, yeah, I'll go in and my, get in my hospital again. I don't care. <laughs> and then Serge was like kind of tired. And I was like, I'm just going to go hang out at the nurse's station. Like, I, it's like I'm, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. Like, I took Benadryl, everything. I just couldn't sleep. So I'm yeah. sitting there in my gown and like my hospital band. And we're just all talking and we're hanging out. And my coworkers and they're like rubbing on my belly. And they're like... Alex, you know, you can do it. Come out. Um, and I was walking around the unit and every time I had like a little contraction, my coworker would like lift my belly up to relieve like the pressure. And I was like, oh, so great. <laughs> and eventually I guess I fell asleep and my hips started real. Those labor beds are not it, you know, like for you go and mm-hmm. have your baby and leave because those like my beds are not comfortable. I remember like waking up like, oh my gosh. And I like, went out was like where's jamie jamie on our unit is just like a goddess when it comes to like spinning babies and stuff like that i'm like i need sideline release because my hips they feel like they're stacked on top of each other and it hurts so much so she came she did some sideline release on me and i mean it just that feeling that i had had was gone i felt safe i felt taken care of i felt so blissful I mean, and I just was like, I had my two journals, my journal that I started for Al when I was pregnant and the journal that I started for Mina when I first found out I was pregnant for her. Like, I still write in that journal. And I'm just writing all these things like, you're going to be a big sister tomorrow. Like, Alec, I'm so excited to meet you. I can't wait. This delivery is going to be so beautiful. Like, I just was, I, it was almost like I was so, uh, you know, ignorance is bliss. I was like, it was like I was a first time mom and I had no idea of all the things that could happen. I was floating on cloud nine. It was amazing. And then morning came and I said bye to my night shift girls. And then my day shift girls came on and we were like, hey, hey, hey," you know, all the things. And I remember I bought dinner for night shift. So there was like Chick-fil-A for night shift. And in the morning there was like ice night bagels and there was a spread and everybody was so happy. And like, it was, it was great. And then my sister came and we were just talking and you know, they checked me and I wasn't really far along. And I'm like, that's weird because this is my second baby. I mean, I know it's been like nine years, but I've delivered people who've had babies 12 years later and they've just 
fallen out of them. And like my body has done this before. Like, why am I not? Why am I dilating? Like, why am I actually getting the six doses of Cytotec right now? Like, I didn't think that I would be the one getting all the doses of Cytotec. Yeah. Um, so uh, my GYN came in and chit-chatting, talked about a plan. It's like, I'm going to check you. I was like, oh, okay. he checked me. And I was like, ah, we're not doing that again. So I have my epidural. What the hell? That hurts so much. And he was like, I'm sorry. He's like, you're like one centimeter. And I was like, what <laughs> he's like wow. yeah he's like we could do a foley balloon i was like miss me with that we're not doing a fucking foley balloon i told no foley balloon so, but he says it because he knew that i didn't want it so he's like yeah we'll do a foley balloon i'm like the fuck we are so he starts <laughs> laughing um he was like do you want to start do you want to try cervical do you wanna start pit i was like let's just start pit because i was like i didn't know what i knew back then i don't know how many doses of side attack i got i don't remember even taking them you know it was mm-hmm. so long ago I remember being on pit, them breaking my water, me screaming my head off, getting my epidural, and then everything took off after I got my epidural. So I was like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start the pit. So he's like, okay, pharmacy takes forever to, I don't know, I don't remember what happened, but there was like no pit on the unit. We usually have it right in the unit. We could just go into the med room and grab it. There was no pit on the unit. They were waiting for pharmacy to send up. It took like two hours, which I wasn't complaining. I was like, Doing my stretches, <laughs> bouncing on the ball, sending videos to my friends. Like, where's Alec at one o'clock in the afternoon? And I'm like bouncing on my ball. Like, he's still inside of me. Um, but I kept thinking to myself, so different for Mina. I already had my epidural. Or I would have had her in an hour. Like, this is crazy. It's like taking so long. But I was, you know, happy to enjoy the ride. And I saw that my neighbor was having some issues with her tracing. So I was like, I'm cool. Just not doing anything right now. Like, let me just hang low like I've been doing. It's totally fine. And then my finally pit was brought up and it was started. And I started to feel like my contractions getting a little more painful. I said, I want to get my epidural where I still have control of myself. I don't want to wait until I'm screaming like I was for Mina because I remember how much pain I was in and thinking to myself, like, there's no way I'm going to be able to wait 45 minutes for this epidural. Like, I can't. I'm in so much pain. Um, And I and I see it every day at work. (laughs) So I just like didn't want to cross that line. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, all right, this is a really great time for me to get my epidural. Like, I'm feeling them. I'm kind of breathing through them, but they're not super unbearable. Um. I have to stop what I'm doing, but like I'm handling it, which like go me because I am such a star when it comes to pain. Like I'm like stub my toe, knock me out. Just wake <laughs> me up when it's over. Like I can't. Um, so I hit my call bell and Danielle, who was my coworker friend and was my nurse, came in and was like, what's up? I was like, I think I'm ready for my epidural. So let's start bolusing me. So she's like, okay, so we have to get like a liter of fluids in. Halfway through, we call the anesthesiologist. And that lead, that bolus is kind of like a body trick, to like help try to help prevent your blood pressure from tanking after you get an epidural. So I was already bolusing. Um, I was like, we'll keep going up on the pit. It's fine. So she's like, okay, cool. So then Dr. Lempel came in and was like, hey, it's like three o'clock. Do you want to like, check see where you are I was like no you're gonna wait till I have my epidural I said but here's the plan I'm gonna get my epidural we're still going up on the pit once I'm feeling good you can come check me break my water and we'll have a baby and he was like cool I gotta go do a c-section I'll be back and I'm like awesome (laughs) and I just loved how much freedom I had to make the choices. Like what dose of side attack do you want? Do you want 50? Do you want 25? Do you want oral? Do you want vaginal? Like I really was leading and directing my labor. And I really was really, really happy about that. Um, You know, if anything had happened and, you know, a conversation needs to be had, Dr. Lampau would put that hat on and he would say, listen, no bullshit. Like this is what has to happen. But it, Mm -hmm. it was easy pregnancy. I was very, very low risk. I was not put on monitors to monitor Alec until they started me on pit. So they checked me like every four hours to a spot check to make sure he was okay. And he was great. He had a beautiful trace. Everything was perfect. Everything was great. And uh, um, my sister had said later, 
we were having a conversation about something. She said, it's seared in my brain and I'll never forget it because you were getting up to go to the bathroom and you said, the truth of the matter is I could deliver a dead baby right now. That's just the nature of this unit. And she's, and that was like one of the last kind of crazy things I said before everything happened. And she said, I'll never, I'll never forget you saying that because then everything happened. And it was like, what the fuck? So I got to go to the bathroom. I was like, oh, I'm bleeding a little bit. That's great. Cervical change. Yay. Woo. You know, like all the things. And um, I remember being on the toilet like, ooh, that was a good one. That was a good contraction. I'm probably going to be like, but and centimeters. No way. <laughs> um, we come out of the bathroom. Serge was like pulling the pole for me so I could walk and and I get to the foot of the bed. So the bed was in, in a position called throne. So the back is like all the way up and the foot of the bed is dropped. And we sat me in that position because Alec had like a little dip at one point. So I was like, no, 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 kid, you are not doing that. Like, put me in throne. I don't know what this kid's doing right now. Like, no. Um, so I was like, I'm going to get the bed ready for the epidural. Like, you know, because Danielle doesn't have to come get the bed ready. I know how to get the bed ready. So I'm just going to be sitting in the position when everybody walks in like, I'm ready for my epidural. Um because again, it's hard to get out of work mode. Like I was a patient, but I was like, am I though? <laughs> like I'm still a labor and delivery nurse. So whatever I was able to do, like I didn't touch my pump at all because I know I shouldn't do that. <laughs> you know, like I just was like, I could do the bed. And I had the peanut ball. You guys seen a peanut ball? Love. I picked up. You love the peanut ball? I love it. I wish I wish I had the chance to use it because they I, never was used on me for Mina. And she came out like ace and clinic like her cap it right here on the side of her head. It just like left me. But, you know, nine years ago, it wasn't as big a thing as it is now. Yeah. Um. So I was standing at the foot of the bed. I picked up the peanut ball and I gave it to my sister. And she was like, what is this? And I'm like, it's a peanut ball. And she's like, oh, my God, what do you do with this? I'm like, we're going to be using that a lot once I get my epidural because I won't be able to get out of bed, but we have to, you know, turn and stuff like that and keep baby engaged, bring him down, open that pelvis. Like, it's going to help. You're going to see the amazing things that this ball does. And she's like, great. Where should, what should I do with it? And I'm like, just put it over there. So this room, the reason why I chose this room is so cool. It was a corner room and it has like a little foyer. So like when I get my epidural, my sister can step out into the foyer instead of like standing in the hallway. And she could sit down. It was a sofa. And then as soon as you walk in to your immediate left, there's like a huge bathroom. And then there's like the, the welcome whiteboard and it had like all my information on it. It was like natural childbirth and my friends crossed it out and they were like, hell no. <laughs> and it was like epidural. Hell yeah. <laughs> you know, it was really cute. And then like straight ahead, as soon as you walk in, you see the labor bed and across from the labor bed. So if you're laying like this, there's the baby alcove. So there's where the warmer is and baby gets weighed over there and everything like that. And then there's like just, you know, cabinets and supplies and stuff like that. So my, I told her, put it there into the baby alcove. So she, she took the ball and she turned and I was like, ow. But it was like the kind of ow, like I screamed so loud. I did not recognize my own voice. Like I heard it and I knew that I produced it, but I didn't recognize myself. And that's when I was like, this is it. This is what I said was going to happen. It's happening. Now, unbeknownst to me, I had felt those three sharp pains that Sunday when I was working so hard. I thought I was going into labor. Like my back was hurting. I was cramping a lot, but I was dehydrated. And I remember getting three pains to my side thinking like, oh, gas. Oh my God, gas. And I think, and I was actually on FaceTime with my best friend when it happened. And I think it was a warning shot. And I'm just so happy that it didn't do what it did while I was at home because I wouldn't be here speaking to you guys right now. So I had the three sharp pains and I keeled over onto the bed. And I remember hearing my voice being so shaky and say, something's not right. The pain was gone, but I just felt not right. And 
some of it gets kind of blurred because it's like, I remember hearing Sir say, do you want me to get your nurse? And me saying like, yes, or maybe I pulled the cord bell out of the wall. Like when you pull the cord, forget it. Everybody comes running. I don't, I don't know how, but all of a sudden everybody was in my room. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody. Like I am back at, I'm back at work now. And like the new girls, the newer girls that were like on orientation or just off orientation, they were like the, the North side was deserted because something was going on with my neighbor and me. And it was Danielle was my nurse for that girl too. So there was like two things going on at once. So she had somebody else take care of her and she came into my room and I screamed, turn off the pit. I, Cause I knew it wasn't the Pitocin. So I'm like, take that off the table, turn off the pit. And then I was like in my head, like trying to diagnose myself. I'm like, all right, it's not my blood sugar because I, I've been, I mean, listen, I've been eating. So it's not my blood sugar. And I said, it has to be my blood pressure. But like, why? Why is my blood pressure dropping? My blood pressure has to be dropping because I was feeling like dizzy. I felt nauseous. Like they gave me the blue bag. And I was like, and then all of a sudden, I couldn't see anymore. And I remember holding onto my coworker's shoulders and looking I'm looking right at her. I know I'm looking at her. And I'm like, I can't see you. I just can't see you. I can't see you. And then I just start saying everything that I'm feeling. I'm like, I like my vision is very pixelated. Like it was squares. Like it's pixelated and it's pink. And I can't see. I can't see anything. And they were like, okay, Nicola, let's get you on the bed. Let's let's get you on the bed. And I remember getting to the foot of the bed. The bed was still on the transition and I just collapsed onto it. I just couldn't hold up my body weight anymore. I felt like cement was running through my veins. And I guess Alec had come off the monitor. I went back and looked at his tracing and it's it's very bad. It's very, very horrible. Um, beautiful heart rate. I know exactly when my artery, rup- what wound up happening was my splenic artery ruptured, but we didn't know that at the time. So I, this, it's, it's just like beautiful heart rate and then just straight down, just straight down 50s. Normal heart rate for a baby is 110 between, between 110 and 160. And sure, when people are in labor, baby's heart rates dip, but they come back up. And he was trying, he couldn't. Because um, you know, to everybody, I was hemorrhaging internally. So if I'm hemorrhaging, he is not getting blood. He yeah. is not getting oxygen. So at some point, it came off the monitor and they were like, we got to let you down. And I remember, I don't know if I said it or I was trying to say it because I was so weak. I was like, I can't. So Serge and Danielle picked me up and like got me into the bed. Um, they were doing all the things. I was already bolusing for my epidural because that's like one. OK, shut the pit, increase the fluids, turn, 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 you know, all the hands and knees, like all the things. Um, they gave me terbutaline, which is a medication that stops contractions. But I, I was like, it's not, I'm not abrupting. Like I wasn't contracting like that to be abrupting. Like this is not an abruption. Something else is going on. Like, what is it? And, you know, and I'm just like thinking this in my head. So this, this, I was living in two words at the same time, like on the outside, I was like, oh, and I was like dying on the inside. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And I'm like yelling and I'm very myself up here. But like externally, I couldn't respond. I was having a really difficult time. I guess at some point, um, my nurse called my OB and was like, Nicolette is in a six minute D-cell. And he's like, call the 24. And the 24 was Dr. Silas. And I remember working with him when I was a new grad and I was like, I don't think like that style is a unit because he was like mean and like all this stuff. But I, I, and then it, I didn't really work with him very often after that. Um, so when he walked in and he was like, hey, Nicolette, it's Dr. Silas. In my head, I'm like, this motherfucker is being so nice to me. Like, how dare he's never nice to me, you know? And I'm like, what? But on the outside, I'm like, like, I can't breathe, like something is wrong. And he didn't know what was going on, but he had told me later, like when he walked in and he saw me, he knew that it was not good because I did not look like myself. I did. I was very, very pale. 
And um, when I he heard me say that I can't see, he was like, something really horrible is happening right now. So he wound up checking me. He said I was three centimeters. In my head, I was like, three fucking centimeters. That's it. The like, what the hell is going on right now? But on the outside, I was like, uh, but, you know, so it was, I had a lot of like duality happening in that moment. It was very, very, it was weird. Like I could look back and laugh at what was going on up here because for a while I was very much myself and very like with it here. Yeah. Um, so he was like, okay, three centimeters, give me amnio hook. I'm breaking her water. The reasoning behind that was if it's an abruption, this is going to come out bloody. Mm-hmm. And then we know what it is and we're rushing back for a C-section. Fluid was clear. So he's like, clear fluid. They're like, all right. He would have put an FSC because they couldn't get Alex's heart rate. Like I heard it. And I remember hearing how low it was because I like you're trained, like I'm trained to, I don't have to look to know that is not 110. That is not 135. That is at least 70 or 60 or 50. That is low. And they put the FSC on. At some point, I remember hearing Serge say, Nick, you're scaring me. And hearing my sister say, what's happening? But everybody was so focused on like, how did this turn around so quickly? What happened? What is going on? So everyone was focused on me and Alec. Nobody was like talking to surgeon Monique, my sister. And that happens sometimes in emergency situations. Our priority is our patient. And Mm -hmm. oftentimes we forget to talk to. But these are things that I've told Serge before this could happen this could happen you know like da da da. stay out of the way and if they need your help help (laughs) you know um and he did and he stood there and he watched and he watched as the life was draining from my body and my lips were turning blue I didn't know that I looked like this but this is what he said I looked like and I remember laying on my back and they always say that like your life flashes before your eyes when you die or are, are dying. And I don't, I don't know that that really happened to me, but I mm-hmm. had this memory being in nursing school and my pathophysiology teacher saying, when your patient says that they're dying, you believe them. And that's when I was like, I need to let them know that I'm dying. Because I know that I'm dying, but they don't know that I'm dying. And if I'm dying, then my son is dying. Thanks, everyone, for listening to Nicolette's birth story. Again, this was a rebroadcast, so you can listen to part two and three in earlier episodes. And we'll be back next week with a brand new birth story. So don't forget to subscribe, share, and connect with us on social media. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion and found it insightful and beneficial. Remember, the Golden Hour Birth Podcast is made possible by the support of listeners like you. If you appreciate the content we bring you each week, consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform or sharing the show with your friends and family. Your support helps us reach more people and continue creating valuable episodes. If you have any questions, suggestions, or topics you'd like us to cover in future episodes, We'd love to hear from you. You can reach us on our website, www.goldenhourbirthpodcast, or connect with us on social media. We value your feedback and want to make sure that we're delivering the content you want to hear. Before we sign off, we'd like to express our gratitude to our incredible guests who joined us today. We are honored that they trust us enough to be so open and vulnerable. We're grateful for their time and willingness to share their stories with us. If you're interested in taking the conversation further with us, join us on our Facebook group, The Golden Hour Birth Circle. We'll be back next week with another exciting episode, so be sure to tune in. Until then, stay golden and remember to take care of yourself. We'll catch you on the next episode of The Golden Hour Birth Podcast. Bye!